right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode here. We got chapter seven this week, so let's get into it right away. A lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of administrations to talk about our first uh, few presidents here. So um, as we get to our first president here, we now have a brand new constitution, which we wrapped up last chapter, is now in effect. Our first president, George Washington, he's got a lot of things to deal with. And some of the things he's got to deal with are as follows. A lot of debt. Okay, We have to come up with a plan to get rid of our debt. We have no stable currency. Remember, all 13 colonies, 13 states, they had their own currencies. There was no unified currency, which made trade a nightmare. There was no national bank, which we'll talk about why that's helpful. No tax system in place. Okay, It was very hard for the first Congress to collect taxes. And then no income for the government. Okay, The government needs income. It needs money. So we'll have to find out how they do that. One of the first things they do, though, when they set up this brand new government with Washington is they... Uh, set up a Judiciary Act, which basically puts together our first Supreme Court. So our first Supreme Court, there are five associate judges with one chief justice. Today, we have nine Supreme Court justices, which um, you may be aware of in current events, because obviously that's come up recently. And there is a reason that we have a nine, an odd number, and that's because we never want to tie in a case. Now, the national debt, one of the biggest things that Washington has to deal with, okay, is... As you can see, there's always some kind of debt. However, there's, in this time, we have a huge amount of debt because of the revolution. And just to give you an idea, I said there's always some kind of debt. You take a look at that number at the bottom of the screen there, how much debt there is today. And that's actually not even accurate because it continues to go up every second. So the guy to come in and save the day will be the first Treasury, Secretary of the Treasury, okay, um, Alexander Hamilton, okay, the guy whose song was playing as we began this video. Hamilton is going to have a, a huge task ahead of him, but it's his plan that really sets our country on pace um, to recover from all the bad stuff that this country began with, with all the debt. So he's going to come up with a couple of ideas, a couple of plans in which we can pay off our debt and stabilize our finances. There are four major parts to his plan. Okay, Now you can see here the first thing is tax on whiskey, which we're going to see that's going to cause a little bit of an issue early on. Um, next, the protective tariff, which makes uh, imported goods way more expensive than our you know, American-made goods, which means... If I'm trying to buy an iPhone and the one made in China is $1,000, the one made in America is $800, the, the exact same product, why is the Chinese made one more expensive? Because it has a protective tariff on it. So as a consumer here living in America, which one am I going to buy? I'm going to buy the one that's made in America, okay, because it's cheaper, essentially. It doesn't have that tariff on it or tax. The third thing that Hamilton is most known for is his national bank. Okay, His national bank is very important. It stabilizes our economy. It puts all of our finances in one place. It allows Congress to collect taxes, put that all in the same place. We can deposit money. We can loan money to other countries. It's all in that consolidated one place, which is very, very important. Um, the Articles of Federation did not have this. and It was very unorganized, hence why they didn't make any money, and hence why our debt only increased. The last thing was that uh, Hamilton wanted to pay off our debt through um, putting or consolidating all the states' debt together. He called that assumption. So all the states had their own debts, and some actually did not. For example, like Virginia didn't have any debt, so they were not for this plan. But he put together all the states' debt. It becomes a national debt. And Hamilton says, here's what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to sell bonds, okay? And that those bonds are going to help pay for our debt. What is a bond? It's like you go to the bank, you have $100 in your hand, you give it to the teller and you say, I want to buy a bond for $100. And the bank teller gives you a piece of paper and it's essentially an IOU note, okay? What's going to happen is you bought a bond for $100. You gave it to the teller at the bank. They gave you a piece of paper. That piece of paper is telling you that you're going to get your $100 back. It's a safe investment. That's what a bond is. But what are you doing? You're loaning the government money for the time being. Okay. So when that bond matures 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, you'll get your $100 back plus interest. Will you become a millionaire off of this idea? No. Why? Because it's a safe investment. Okay. People make a lot of money off of unsafe investments or risky investments. So 
that's just a rundown once again of Hamilton's plan. Um, so Hamilton's plan comes into question because a lot of people said, well, this is going to favor um, northerners or manufacturers, okay? This plan is not going to favor the South and agriculture. And so they come to a compromise. The South says, guys like Jefferson, okay, who is Hamilton's biggest opponent, he says, listen, Jefferson, um, what I want, as in Jefferson to Hamilton, I want the capital of the United States. And Hamilton says, listen, I don't really want to do that. Jefferson says, well, if you don't do that, then you're not going to have your plan, your four components. And so they agree to compromise. The capital of the United States is moved from New York City to Washington, D.C. In the interim, while it's being built, it's in Philadelphia for a brief period of time. But the first capital was in New York, but then it moves to modern day Washington, D.C. Why? Because Hamilton's compromised to get his bank, to get his tax on whiskey, etc. Okay, so that's Hamilton's compromise. Okay. Um, one of the most important things about Washington's presidency is um, obviously the precedence that he sets for the future presidents. And one of the major things that Washington does um, is he sets our foreign policy pretty early on. Our foreign policy, our first foreign policy is issued in 1793, and it's called the Proclamation of Neutrality. Now, Washington was very meticulous with this. He purposely did this because um, he did not want us getting involved in other European affairs. We're a brand new country. We are not very strong, and we need to mind ourselves, okay, and worry about our own country before we get involved in other countries' business. So when the French Revolution is going on over in Europe, the French call upon us to help them out, right? They helped us out in our revolution, and without them, there's no way the American Revolution could have been successful for us. So they call upon us, and Washington says, no, I'm sorry, we have to remain neutral. This is a big blow to the French. Uh, they're not happy about this. But this proclamation of neutrality is going to stick with us for a long time, okay? We are going to stay neutral in European and world affairs for a long time uh, with the you know advice from Washington here. And this precedent is very, very important. But not everybody agrees with Washington, guys like Jefferson, for example. Jefferson, who was his first Secretary of State, actually will resign because he is not in agreement with Washington over this proclamation of neutrality. Jefferson is very close to the French and says, this is not right. We definitely should help them out because they helped us out. So this does start to cause a split in our government, and you're going to start to see people on two different sides, which means we're going to start to call them our first political parties. And the first political parties are going to be called the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Now, the people that were on Washington's side that were for centralized government, they were your Federalists. So Washington, Adams, Alexander Hamilton, um, they are Federalists. Whereas the Democratic Republicans, or also referred to as the uh, Jeffersonian Republicans, they are going to be in favor of helping France. Um, they are going to favor agriculture, the South, less government, more power to the state governments, um, and they 
are certainly going to be against this proclamation of neutrality. And when it comes to France, that is. Things start to heat up even more um, when you have a French citizen named Edmond Genet, who is traveling the United States trying to convince and rally support uh, amongst people to um, help the French in their French Revolution. And ultimately, he will be, um, you know, kind of banished and uh, sent back to France because uh, we do not like this, um, this citizen Genet trying to stir things up here. Um, we also have some issues with England and Spain. England is continuously bullying us, uh, even though we won the revolution, even though they were supposed to leave all of their uh, frontier forts. They're still out there and they're doing a couple of things that are really starting to tick us off. One, um, they're still there physically in their forts in the West and we don't have the power to kick them out. But also, they're doing something called impressment. This means whenever they see us on the open sea, they are hopping aboard our ships and taking all of our cargo and taking our sailors and throwing them into the British Navy. This is not good. So Washington sends John Jay, one of our uh, Supreme Court justices, he sends him over to England to try to negotiate to get them to stop doing this. And John Jay comes back with what's called Jay's Treaty. And Jay's Treaty... Um, allows us to get some of the British to leave those Western forts, but it doesn't address anything about impressment. So was it successful? That's obviously debatable. Not a lot of people think that was a very successful trip. The Jay's Treaty kind of useless. Um, it doesn't involve anything to do with impressment. Does it keep us neutral? Yes. Do we go to war with England? Not again, just yet. Okay, we'll see how this issue comes up in a little bit. Next, Spain. Uh, we have some issues with them because, remember, they own Spanish Florida. They're also out in the west, past the Mississippi River. And they own the bottom half of that Mississippi River, uh, which is detrimental to us because we need to use it for trade. So anytime we want to use it, um, we're kind of blocked out by the Spanish. They're not letting us use it. So Pickney's Treaty is actually going to help solve that issue. Spain agrees to let us use the bottom portion of the Mississippi River and the Port of New Orleans. Obviously, we have to pay tribute. We have to pay money to them to use it, but at least we're able to use it for trade. Um, and then, obviously, the, you can see the bottom note there. The bottom um, boundary, if you will, is the, or the new boundary is the 31st parallel. Um, but this was huge for us to use for trade, okay? So this was a positive, okay? Now, our next issue is with Native Americans who are also on the frontier. Uh, the Native Americans obviously still going to keep fighting us because we're encroaching on their land as we push further west. You're going to see a bunch of uh, tribes in the Ohio Valley area kind of formed together, calling themselves a the Northwest Confederacy. They're led by one chief um, in the Miami um, Confederation. His name is Little Turtle. Uh, you're going to see a big battle between us and the Native Americans at what's called the Battle of the Fallen Timbers. Um, and they, the Native Americans are going to be defeated and they're going to be forced to sign, not you know very willingly, but forced to sign the Treaty of Greenville, which gives up their claims to the Ohio Valley area. Um, and this will kind of be your last resistance in the area for a little while until we get to the War of 1812. All right. So again, doesn't work out for the wealth. Okay, another thing that happens during the Washington presidency that's really going to define, um, you know, some of the things that he is going to do and uh, take action against is the Whiskey Rebellion. So I mentioned before earlier with um, Alexander Hamilton being the first secretary of the Treasury, one of the parts of his component of the plan, um, his financial plan, that is, was the uh, tax on whiskey. And that's going to target, um, obviously, people who are going to distill whiskey, and that's going to target farmers who actually um, 
use excess corn to distill whiskey. So these farmers in Pennsylvania, they're upset because they feel targeted by this tax. And so they rise up and they say, listen, we fought a revolution against taxes. We don't want to pay this tax on whiskey. And so they refuse to pay. And as you can see in this little cartoon, well, little picture here, I should say, is this is a tax collector who is tarred and feathered. Sounds like a cartoon, right? And so now Washington has a very important decision to make. What do you do about these farmers refusing to pay this tax? So what he does is he gathers up the military, okay, the army, and he's going to march to these farmers in Pennsylvania, put down the rebellion, and collect the tax. As you can see um, here, uh, Washington coming in uh, doing this. Now what this does is this sends a message to you know the Americans, the, all these new citizens that hey listen, this new government is stronger. Um, this new government is you know not playing games here. We're going to collect our taxes and we need to um, do what we got to do. Now, in contrast, there's another rebellion we talked about in last chapter that this did not happen. Okay, that rebellion being Shays' Rebellion, in which they couldn't put it down because they didn't have a national military. There was no president figure to do this. Um, so you see the difference with Shays' Rebellion. There was an inability to put it down, which proved the weakness of the Articles of Confederation. Contrasting now with the Whiskey Rebellion, Washington coming in himself, the president, putting this rebellion down shows the strength of this new government. So that is a very important uh, theme to know. Shays' Rebellion revealed the weakness of the government. Whiskey Rebellion reveals the strength of this new government. Okay, so a lot of things in the Washington presidency, and it all comes to an end. He is a two-term president. There was no law, no amendment that said you had to serve, you know, one, two, three, four terms. Washington steps down after two. Uh, he really didn't even want to run in the first place and did not want to do a second term, but felt it was his national duty to do so. So he's out. He resigns. Okay, he is going to retire. He's pretty old at this point. He just wants to go back to his Mount Vernon uh, place and retire. And he does so. And he only lasts a couple, really a couple of years until he uh, dies. So the things to take away from his presidency and his farewell address is the following. He says, listen, I'm out. I'm retiring. But a couple of things I want the country to remember after I'm gone. Please remain neutral in foreign country affairs. Makes sense, right? His proclamation of neutrality he wants that to live on. We'll see if that lives on. The second thing is he wants us to avoid political parties. He doesn't like this divide between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Um, unfortunately, though, we already see the political parties and the people and the divide happen. Uh, he's not going to be able to avoid the parties from being created, which is unfortunate. Um, why did he not want political parties? Because he doesn't want that sectionalism. He doesn't want that divide, um, you know, to take hold. So he's out. Okay, and like I said, he only lasts a couple of years before he passes away. Um, but that means we have. Okay, and you can look on this in your own time. This is the differences between the Federalists and Democratic Republicans. We have our next president of the United States, who was our first vice president, and that would be John Adams. John Adams, um, a very different person from Washington. He is not as popular. He is obviously much uh, smaller in statue, um, but he is also going to be very tempered. He is not going to be your great compromiser like Washington. Um, and we'll see a couple of things that happen that kind of prove these qualities of him. Now, during this time period, the loser of a presidential election becomes the vice president. So John Adams wins. He was the Federalist. He ran against Thomas Jefferson, the Democratic Republican, and Jefferson becomes the vice president. Now, because of these two guys and because they can't talk to each other and because they become such bitter rivals, this is the reason that we got rid of this idea of making the loser vice president. Okay, so... It worked, or they thought it would work because, you know, maybe having different schools of thought in the White House between the president and vice president, but because Adams and Jefferson, this will come to an end.
Okay, so welcome to the Adams administration. Uh, John Adams is only a one-term president, but he has a couple of things that do happen that do go down. So let's talk about these different events because they're very significant. Okay, so first off, um, the XYZ affair is one of the biggest things that happens during his presidency. Um, I mentioned, you know, his, you know, demeanor is a little bit different than Washington. So let's see what, what happens here. So French ships are kind of doing what the British are doing to us. They're impressing us. They're holding our ships for ransom. And, you know, we're a brand new country. We are, you know, not very powerful and we're weak. So the French are taking advantage, right? They're kind of pissed at us for not helping out in the French Revolution. So we see the French, they take our ships and John Adams sends, um, you know, a diplomat to the French to try to compromise, to try to talk this out so that they can stop doing this. And... Instead of talking it out, the French, you know, send this, you know, Talleyrand to, to talk to us and basically says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to refer to you um, to three agents that I'm not going to tell you their names and you can, you know, pay us some tribute, pay us some money, and then you can talk to our three agents here and you can compromise from there. And John Adams is like, wait, you want us to pay you money to talk? No, 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 that's not how we do things here. John Adams, like I said, huge temper, says, absolutely not. Screw you guys. We don't wind up talking to them. We don't pay tribute. Um, and so we kind of stand up to the French here. And this is now going to have an effect on some policies here in America. So what's going to happen is you're going to see um, a little quasi-war kind of break out between us and the French. And that just kind of means like a mini war on the, the seas. And whenever we see one of each other's ships, we kind of, you know, attack them and whatnot. But we never declare a war on the French. But that's what a quasi war is. So no one really wins or loses that. But the effects here at home domestically from John Adams, we're going to see a couple of laws passed, like the Alien Sedition Acts. Now, the Alien Act allows the president to expel any foreigner thought to be dangerous to the country. This is going to be aimed at the French. All right, so if he wants to kick out someone who is French, because obviously he's pissed off at the French, he can do so according to this act. The Sedition Act says the country can fine anybody or put them in jail who criticizes the government. Once again, if people are speaking out as saying that we should help the French or that we should give in to them or pay them, um, he can put your butt in jail. All right, so these Alien Sedition Acts, they're pretty powerful. And they certainly limit certain freedoms that, you know, we... Uh, we're very uh, meticulous in setting up our country, our constitution, our bill of rights. So you're going to have a couple of people that say, wait, you can't do this. This is very unconstitutional. And so guys like Jefferson and Madison, what they're going to do is in response to these alien sedition acts, they're going to write something called the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. Now, these are anonymous. Okay, we don't know this is from Jefferson and Madison at the time. But they publish these resolutions. So what do they say? They basically say that any state can nullify a federal law if they think it's unconstitutional. So first off, what is nullify? Nullify means not listen to. What you're telling me is that if New York doesn't like a federal law, let's just say the drinking age is 21, you're telling New York that if they don't like that law, they don't have to listen to it. They can make up their own law. So then what's the purpose of the federal government? This is a very dangerous precedent. Okay, what Jefferson and Madison have done is they're setting the stage for future issues when states don't want to follow federal laws. So you're going to see in the future something happen during Andrew Jackson's presidency. You're going to see up to the Civil War Okay, southern states not want to listen to the federal government. And this all goes back to the precedent that is set right here during the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. It's a very, very, very dangerous precedent being set here. And this was a big mistake by these guys. For as smart as they are, they did not foresee the future things that would come. But um, you know, nullifying federal laws is not a good idea. Okay? So make sure you know the Alien Sedition Acts, their response to the XYZ affair, the effect of the Alien Sedition Acts is the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions.
Okay, so we just talked about John Adams. He is on his way out because he gets, um, he loses, I should say, his re-election in 1800. You can see here that he loses to Jefferson, the guy that he won against four years earlier. Jefferson is going to be very popular, and you can see by 1804 he you know, almost unanimously wins um, because the country wants and you know this continued um, Jeffersonian school of thought. So let's talk now about um, what happens here in this transition of power. Now Jefferson is in as the third president. He was your second vice president. Some of the things he's going to do, we're going to talk about, he's going to expand the country. He's going to alter some things that are going on in the government, make them smaller. We'll talk about what that means. He reduces the size of the military. Um, he gets rid of many jobs, or you know, we call this, um, uh, this uh, government size. Um, he repeals some taxes, like the whiskey tax, which caused an issue. He lowers the national debt. Uh, and he has an only Republican cabinet. Not a big deal, but you can just see the shift in thought. So, Jefferson is now going to be your third president, but Adams is not going away without a fight. Like I said, he's a very, um, very vocal, uh, kind of a tempered guy, and we're going to see this come up with this transition to power. So, not that Adams is going to refuse to leave or anything like that, um, but what you're going to see is, on his way out, but the days before he is, you know, out of the presidency, he is going to appoint a bunch of people to uh, government positions. Now, the president has the ability to appoint people to uh, high-ranking positions. So if you're Adams and you're a Federalist, you've been voted out by now Jefferson, who is a Democratic Republican, you're going to want to make sure that many of your people in your party, your political party, are going to get jobs because you don't know what's going to happen there on after. You're kind of seeing this today, right? You're going to see, um, you're seeing Trump right now uh, put people in power just in case he loses the election, right? And that's, you know, you just saw with his Supreme Court justice nomination. So Adams, he's appointing all these people. And literally to the last minute, okay, he's appointing people to positions. One of the people he appoints is William Marbury. And it's a judicial appointee. Okay, he's going to be a judge. And what happens is the paperwork never makes it there in time. Now, Adams has been um, not demoted, but he is no longer president. Jefferson is now in. William Marbury is supposed to be appointed. The paperwork never made it there in time. Basically, everybody dragged their feet on delivering that paperwork. And William Marbury is told, you did not get the job because it didn't go in time. So he sues. He sues the government, specifically the Secretary of State, the new Secretary of State, James Madison. He says, listen, that was not cool. You dragged your feet on all this. And I'm suing you because I want my position. This is going to be a very important court case called Marbury versus Madison. Marbury, who wanted the position he was owed, uh, according to Adams, and Madison, the Secretary of State, who is refusing to deliver his commission to put his paperwork through. So this court case, our very first Supreme Court case that we're talking about, very important. Um, the precedent that we get from this, okay, is that judicial review. What does this mean? The Supreme Court realizes, wait, we no longer can just review laws and whether or not they're constitutional or not. We can actually review the actions of our own government and establish whether or not they're constitutional or not. They review what Adams did with his midnight appointees, and they say, you know what? That wasn't right. He shouldn't have done that. Okay, and so poor William Marbury, who is... Um, you know, promised this appointee this spot as a judge. He doesn't wind up getting it. The Supreme Court shuts it down. Marbury versus Madison rules in favor of uh, Madison. Now, the term that we get from this, like I said, is judicial review. And this is very important. You must remember this from this Supreme Court case. Do you necessarily have to remember the entire story of William, uh, William Marbury versus Madison? No. But you need to remember judicial review. Judicial review is very simple. All it means is the Supreme Court realizes its power, okay, that they can review all actions of the government, okay, and review whether or not they're constitutional. 
This is the Supreme Court opening their eyes saying, wow, we're just as important as the other two branches. Okay, so make sure you know what judicial review means. All right, let's talk about some other things that go on in Jefferson's presidency. Uh, one of the biggest things he is remembered for, and this is you know something you talk about all the way back in elementary school, is the Louisiana Purchase. Um, he buys this from France. Napoleon is uh, waging his wars over in Europe, so he sees a good opportunity to make some money, and he sells Louisiana territory to the United States for $15 million. This is a bargain. There's no sarcasm there. This really is. There's a lot of land for that money. Um, the biggest things we get from it is not only that it doubles the size of the United States, but we gain access to the entire Mississippi River. This is big for trade. And even bigger than that is we gain the port of New Orleans, okay, which is very important to trade and commerce. Okay, so the Louisiana Purchase is very, very important. Okay, a lot of states are going to come from this. A lot of farmland we're going to see uh, and the benefits for trade. Now, as you may remember from elementary school or even middle school, that he sends, Jefferson that is, two explorers to explore this land. Okay, Lewis and Clark, they're going to explore this land because they're trying to find a water route to the Pacific Ocean. Okay, and they're not sure if it exists, but they're going to find out. And it takes them a couple of years to do this trip. Um, there's a couple of guys with them and they're going to meet some people along the way. They're going to interact with a lot of Native Americans. And there's a lot of cool stuff that goes down on this trip. And those two and a half years that they're gone, they find a lot of new um, animals that they've never seen before, a lot of uh, plants we've never seen before, a lot of Native Americans we've never met before. Um, but they make it back in two and a half years. They're not even sure if Jefferson is the president anymore. But they wind, wind up coming back. He's still president. He's reelected. One of the people they meet along the way that they never would have survived without her help is Sacagawea. Um, she's a Native American woman who helps them across the land. She knows a lot of things about the Native Americans they're going to encounter. She speaks some of their languages. Um, and she gives birth while on the way. So she's a pretty tough woman. All right, You may have seen her on the, the golden dollar before uh, you might have gotten. All right, But very, very important woman. Okay, so other issues that we're having uh, during the Jefferson administration is impressment once again. It's still happening. Uh, we're very upset that the French and the British are kind of impressing our sailors. 
You don't have to worry about um, the Berlin Decree or orders in council, but I just want you to know that both countries are impressing our ships. And we have one kind of incident that kind of has a domino effect with uh, some policies that Jefferson is going to pass. And in 1807, the Chesapeake Leopard Affair, England, um, their uh, ship, the Leopard, attacks the Chesapeake American ship uh, off the coast there of the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia area. Now, because they attack it, um, you're going to see this huge kind of effect or domino effect happen. And Jefferson is very upset. He says, you know what, in order to re you know, respond to this, all of this impressment and attacking, uh, we're going to issue the Embargo Act of 1807, one of your vocabulary terms for this chapter. The Embargo Act says no more U.S. trade with all foreign nations. The intended effect is to hurt other countries and their trade, um, however, you know, England and France, they can kind of get by without our trade. So it doesn't really have the intended effect. One of the unintended consequences is that it actually fuels our first industrial revolution. Because we don't have the export, I'm sorry, before we don't have, because we don't have the imports coming in, it forces us to actually uh, make our own goods. And that's going to be the birth of our first industrial revolution, which we'll talk more about in a future chapter. Um, but for now, no more trade with other countries. The intended effect, as I said, was to hurt other countries, but it really doesn't. By 1809, Jefferson is on his way out of office. He has served two terms. Um, on his way out, what he does is he passes the uh, 1809 Non-Intercourse Act, which says that uh, the United States will trade with all countries except England and France. That still doesn't have the desired effect. Um, we still won't be able to... Um, have you know all that you know great uh, lucrative trade that we were hoping for um, so we even reform that to Macon's bill number two which says listen we're going to end all the embargoes that we have passed um, as long as these countries respect our neutrality and freedom of the seas basically we're backing down the embargo act was a huge failure um, we try to reform it and it doesn't work out this is going to carry over into the causes for the war of 1812 uh, which we're going to talk about right now. So Jefferson is out. He spent two terms. In comes his former Secretary of State, James Madison, and Madison's presidency is uh, marked by the War of 1812, uh, which a lot of people were calling for in Congress. We call them the War Hawks because they wanted this war. Why? Um, because we want to stop the British from harassing us. Remember, they're impressing our sailors, our ships. They are still on the Western frontier. They're selling guns to the Native Americans. And while we're at it, why don't we throw in their Canada? Okay, we did have the desire to actually invade and take over Canada. So um, this war is going to be an interesting one. I have a lot of slides that you can look at on your own time um, about the War of 1812. And um, one of the things that we have to mention now is the Native Americans in the War of 1812. The Native Americans were actually um, technically on both sides, but they really were on the side of the British uh, because the British promised them their land back if they helped the British in this war. And you're going to see guys like Tecumseh uh, be on the side here, and they're going to be attacked, and they are going to be defeated by future President William Henry Harrison at the Battle of Tippecanoe. And this is kind of your last major resistance in this area of the Native Americans. Um, but the War of 1812, okay, the war is de declared. Remember, Congress declares war, not the president. We declare war. We wanted Canada. The Democratic Republicans, okay, that they're in office. Madison is a Democratic Republican, um, and they are going to go through with this war. So a desire for more land and to stop impressment are major causes.
All right, so as you just saw, there's a bunch of stuff that I have there on the War of 1812. You can take a look at it in your own time. Things like the uh, White House was burned down by the British. Uh, we certainly had a hard time trying to invade Canada. We are concerned more about causes and effects of the war. Um, so the causes we talked about now, the effects of the war. Um, the nation was very divided over the War of 1812. Obviously, the invasion of Canada was not a success. Uh, the burning down of the White House did not go very well for us. We're you know, trying to save things within the White House as it's burning down. Um, the positives, the Star Spangled Banner was written during this war. Um, you saw that in there. Uh, Francis Scott Key writes our national anthem while he's watching the burning of Fort McHenry. That's great. Um, but the war comes to an end with the Treaty of Ghent, uh, and it actually kind of is a stalemate the whole war. And you say, wow, it sounds like things went really bad for us. How did we kind of come to this like stalemate kind of a treaty um, where nothing is lost or gained? Well, really because the British are dealing with uh, events over in Europe, you know, Napoleon is still waging war in Europe, and so they want to get out of this war uh, just as badly as we do. So we sign this Treaty of Ghent, ends the war, nothing is gained or lost. Um, the British kind of decide to leave more forts out in the frontier, which is good. Nothing is mentioned about impressment. They're still going to impress our ships and our sailors, which is unfortunate, but at least the war has ended. We're stopped, you know, we stopped losing money. Um, one of the interesting things is after, after the Treaty of Ghent is signed, it takes about two weeks um, for the last battle to actually happen. You say, wait, why would the battle happen after the treaty is signed? Well, because, you know, word traveled very slow back then. They didn't exactly have all of the uh, instant lines of communication we have today. So Andrew Jackson, future president, actually um, gets a huge victory for us and, you know, bombards the British at the Battle of New Orleans. And a huge victory for the United States. But again... This was after the war was already over, so he kind of makes his name during this Battle of New Orleans. Last thing to talk about, which is very important for the War of 1812, and the exam likes to talk about this, is something called the Hartford Convention. Uh, right before the war had been officially over, um, the Federalists actually met in New England. Remember, the Federalists are kind of you know in opposition to this war because guys like Madison, he's the Democratic Republican, they're the ones that you know were kind of for this war. The Federalists met up in New England and. They actually are talking about, you know, their uh, staying for the war. They don't like this. They actually want to uh, vote on seceding from the Union. That means to leave. And then as this meeting is going on, uh, the Treaty of Ghent is now signed and the war is over. And now these Federalists are viewed as unpatriotic, as being, you know, hey, listen, you guys don't have faith in our system and our country. And we ended this war. You know, you guys aren't um, patriotic. So this is actually going to lead to the Federalists becoming, um, you know, kind of dying out. Okay, the Federalist Party is going to dissolve after this, and we're not going to see them around for um, a little while. All right, so the Democratic Republicans, they signed the Treaty of Ghent, and they're on a winning side. And you're actually going to see only the Democratic Republicans, the only political party for some time. We're going to call that the Era of the Feelings, which we'll talk about coming up. So legacy, last thing to talk about here. Um, just kind of wrapping it all up, we have survived two wars against the British, which is, you know, pretty impressive. Um, you know, England uh, has Canada still. We'll have to accept that. The Federalists, as we just talked about, they die out. The ideas of nullification and secession are actually, you know, still around, which is not good. This is going to set precedence for later on as we talk about road to civil war. Um, the Native Americans surrender a lot of land to the Americans. They're not very happy about that. We talk about the rise of our industrial uh, New England area as a result of the Embargo Act. Future presidents like Andrew Jackson and William Henry Harrison are going to become you know, household names as they run for president soon. Um, and you're going to see a rise in nationalism after the War of 1812. People are pretty pumped up about um, you know, their patriotism and their love for America because, you know, hey, we just kind of survived slash won two wars against the British. All right. That's where we're going to end. Uh, hopefully this video we found to be helpful. Give it a like, subscribe, and peace out.